Thanks, everyone. We're going to move right along. Just to, we've got so much to talk about. So our next session this morning is Artists at Work. How do you sustain your practice? Um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about this one too, actually. All, every session I think, oh, this is my favourite. But um, I think it's always, there's a lot of artists in the room as well. We have two wonderful artists up the front. Um, and we'll have a little bit more time for some conversation and questions in this session so we can hear about how you sustain your practice as well. Um, and we're going to focus really on the production side here, like in how we, where we work and what we make, um, and move into discussions around kind of then the sharing of that in our third session. So um, let's think about how we, we, we sustain that sort of production and um, yeah, focus on the, the studio. So I have with me up the front here, um, Dr. Kylie Banyard. Um, Kylie is an artist and lecturer in visual art at La Trobe University. Her artistic practice engages with painting, photography, textiles and sculpture to explore the capacity of art to rekindle our relationship with the utopian imagination. And here I have Manal Lorne. Manal is a contemporary artist based on Jajarang um, country also, at Glen Lyon. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, Manal works with, uh, all makes dom intimate domestic scale ceramic works um, that celebrate the reconciliation of her Indian heritage with her Australian upbringing. So we'll hear a little bit about each of your practices to begin with, what you do and what you make and what um, informs that. Um, and if you can tell us where that takes place as well would be really good. And we'll start with you Kylie because I think your slides are first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, lots of familiar faces here and, and lots of new faces so hopefully I get to, um, do I have to press anything? No. no? Yeah. Hopefully I get to uh, chat with some of the people's faces who are new to me um, at some point later on today. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge that I am here living and working in Bendigo on the unceded lands of the Jajawarung and that's a great honour. Uh, so to start with, uh, I live, yes, I, I live just up the road, um, not far from where I work, which is at La Trobe University uh, in Flora Hill on the campus there. Um, and that's where I make my art as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but I have this thing where I'm going to read a little bit because if I don't, I'll ramble and I may not say everything that I want to say about my work. Um, have you got another one after this? Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, so just just quickly, uh, my and lots of you have heard this before actually, but so I'll make it quick. But my practice engages with, with painting, photography, textiles and sculpture generally. But it also intersects with fields such as architecture and education. Um, I, I live in, a, in an educational setting, very like, you know, pretty much seven days a week sometimes, um, to explore the critical potential of, of the utopian imagination, as Karen said. So in my work, I question and test how speculative and poetic encounters with place and the more than human world can bring about other more generative and just ways of being. Earlier bodies of work of mine have centred around painting, a painting process concerned with reanimating archival images that's not what you're looking at here. Um, this is a different way of working that I'll talk about in a moment uh, that, that kind of drew from the past to speculate about sort of hidden histories and um, utopian futures. Uh, I often focus on the ways that women have contributed to utopian social experiments uh, and my interest in making and presenting textile work, which I generally do all the time at the moment as part of my practice, textile work that I make and sometimes in collaboration with others, alongside and in conversation with my paintings, gestures towards the, impact, the uh, importance that I place on the representation of women engaged in acts of creative labour. So to speak directly to this work, in my recent work I've kind of turned away from working from the photographic archive um, to focus more attention on daily rituals and my immediate surroundings. 
So the aims of this current work um, are still concerned with um, the utopian imagination, um, but I've started to focus on exploring the agency and the unknowable otherness of plants to learn from their deeply embedded ways of being. Through my work, I question and test how encounters with veg vegetal beings can give way to unique and illuminating insights into place in the more than human world. So this work, this is a work sitting alongside Ilka White's work, I should mention, um, was recently shown in Canberra. Uh, but this, this way of working um, was first, I first exhibited um, this, this newer way of working in 2022 at Nicholas Thompson Gallery, my gallery in Melbourne, at an exhibition um, called Becoming Sessile. And the works were made in direct response to a daily ritual with my six-year-old son, um, which we'd perform on walks together as we'd document our sensory effective encounters touching and talking to plants. We affectionately referred to this process as touching um, and together we'd photograph each other's careful touch and in these moments we'd discuss the way that the plant feels and smells. So our ritualised encounters with veg vegetal beings seek to acknowledge um, the plant's peculiar subjectivity and agency. It's a playful process. Um, my phone's full of thousands of photographs of little hands touching plants. Um, and it holds a certain magic for us. It brings us closer together, obviously, as we learn how to connect that this place, with this place that we call home, as we try to find a way as settlers and visitors being here on, on Jarra country. Uh, from here, I take a selection of the touching photographs um, into the studio, and I start the slow process of laying down layers of acrylic and, and oil colour and carefully uh, applying and transcribing details from the images in oil uh, atop, um, on top of plant-based, a uh, plant-dyed stretched canvas. So I, I, I lay the plant colour, I embed the plant colour, um, not always the plant that I'm painting, um, but plant, plant material that surrounds me. Um, I embed it into the canvas before I start painting on it. Um, and yeah. That's, oh, and the, the sorry, I didn't realise we were on this slide. And so, nice, nicely done, Karen. And so that, that, that um, little assemblage of bricks and coloured liquid um, in the foreground there was, is a work that my son made, uh, who's now seven, his name's Hal. Uh, well, we made it together, but that, that he, drove, he drove the making of that. So that is what he calls bubble fume. And um, so whilst I'm painting, he's, he's collecting different combinations of plants and um, trying to extract, I guess, colour from them and carefully preserving, preserving the colours. Um, and so they went into the gallery to sit alongside this show. Uh, they went nice and mouldy, sadly, and poor Nick had to dispose of those <laughs> at the end of the show. Um, yeah, but, but that's kind of where I'm at with what I make. I'll talk about, I guess, how that happens next. and where next. Thank you. That's ready to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're a much nicer mother than I am. I don't let my kids in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't fight that anymore. <laughs> they know when I'm in there, it's just time for mama. So, yep. Um, Manal Lorne, ceramic artist based in Glenline, as Karen was saying. Um, I guess conceptually my practice speaks to my Australian upbringing and my Indian cultural heritage. Uh, I aim to celebrate their reconciliation through my own language of colour and a ceramic vernacular. Uh, materially, I use clay, which, oh, that's not my no, word. No, not no. Um, <laughs> I use clay and colour. So as I said before, colour is a very big part of my practice. Um, I enjoy the contradictions of organic forms and flat, sharp planes in my sculptures. I use highly saturated colours and create a palette of my own. So I use sort of commercially available stains, but uh, mix them to make my own colours. Um, and really like the dynamic relationship that's created with the handmade and geometry, which is something that features a lot in the way that I exhibit my work. 
Uh, I guess, um, yeah, yeah don't, don't, don't have the work, that's <laughs> no, fine, yeah. Have yeah. you got a website? I do yeah. have a website, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just my name, myname.com. Um, <laughs> myname.com, <laughs> my name. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, I guess, would you prefer to talk about the sort of exhibition side of things, or yeah? So, yeah. Yeah, so you produce the work, and like, you know, how does that? And then what happens? Keep yes, it? yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so, I guess, from a studio sort of side of things, if that's what we're sort of going to concentrate on, um, I'm pretty pragmatic with the way that I practice. I'm I'm in there specific days a week. I I allocate certain days a week to. Um, to my practice. I also have a young family. Um, we live on a farm. There's lots of things to do. We have a, you know, a numerous, numerous things to do in life, as everyone does. Um, so I'm quite particular with the days that I keep allocated for practice. Um, this is a recent show at uh, a solo at Stockroom in Kyneton, which um, was a really wonderful show. It's the first time I've, I've showed in a commercial space. Yeah. And, it actually just showed me the value of exhibiting in a space like that with regard to um, the access that galleries like that have to, to people to, to buy your work and, um, and actually put it out in the world. So that was wonderful. Uh, the works here are from a, a, a body of work that I'm sort of currently exploring, which looks at uh, sculptural and aesthetic elements of Hindu <coughs> temple architecture. And I'm looking at various uh, conceptual elements as well, specifically murti, which is uh, an object of worship, and I've sort of transposed that that kind of concept into, as I was saying, a ceramic vernacular. So looking at a vessel, what is a vessel, deifying a vessel in that context, and um, you know, using, like I said, my own my own language to to convey that to the audience. Yeah, sure. Um, I can talk about that show if you like. Yeah, so that was um, also an exploration of objects of worship, which was a solo I had at the backspace area in um, the Art Gallery of Ballarat, which was last July. And that was actually paying homage to Murilani Mukherjee, who is an incredible Indian fibre artist who... I just think is absolutely wonderful and slightly under, not under the radar as such, but has become a little bit more aware, um, well known since her death, unfortunately. Um, she would make floor to ceiling sculptures out of hand dyed, you know, knotted fabrics. And I just loved the idea that she was an Indian woman in the 70s doing this, sort of challenging the stereotypical norm of men making art. And, you know, I just really sort of, um, I, her work appealed to me, her philosophy appealed to me, her, her actual um, chutzpah appealed to me, actually. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so we're, we're hearing here what sustains you kind of um, conceptually, you know, and, like, um, you know, how... Uh, what you're surrounded by, what you're looking at, um, you know, how that actually drives what's happening in the studio, um, which is incredibly interesting. And we could run a whole day session just on, you know, yeah, focusing more on um, the objects. And we're all going to delve back in anyway and have a look a bit more about at what you do. Um, but on a more pragmatic level, um, I, I was interested in um, both as mothers as well, like this difference... Um, in how you sort of manage the role of like motherhood and um, art production so that there's that in the mix and I guess that's where my mind is at the moment we have an exhibition maternal inheritances which you know touches on um, the, those um, yeah conundrums I guess for many um, artist mothers um, so there's that but then there's you know um, making an income uh, as you say like working like being in the education um, environment sometimes seven days a week so on a purely practical level how do you how, where's your studio when do you get in it how often and you know how is how is that sustainable and is it something that you would like to see slightly different <laughs> I think I know the answer to that <laughs> Oh, it's a big question. 
Uh, lots of questions, I guess, um, in there. So uh, my situation at the moment is different to what it has been. I mean, we all change and our lives change, but for the last, coming up to seven years, I've been working full time at La Trobe um, as a visual arts lecturer. Uh, prior to that, I was engaged in the endless hustle of um, working as a casual academic and still teaching. Um, and I guess finding a way to also have a practice. So for me now, um, I've gotten to a point where um, I have one commercial gallery that represents me at the moment. I did have two. I had one in Sydney as well for a long time. I'm from Sydney, spent most of my adult life there, moved to Bendigo, well, actually moved to Bendigo via Mildura for um, an academic gig at La Trobe. Um, and so I, I'm in my household, there I have two kids, um, and my partner's also an artist. In my household, I'm the, I guess, the main breadwinner. And so um, getting a gig as an, acad as an artist, as an academic is, yes, it's full on, but it's also really amazing. Um, I, you know, earn an income that I never thought I'd, I would, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's hard work to get. It's hard to secure a continuing role and actually it always feels like it can be pulled out from under you at any moment, you know, if the university decides to restructure and, and things can get ugly, but they haven't for us at, in visual arts at La Trobe, which is great. Um, but my partner is the stay-at-home carer, um, so he gets to, I guess, our kids aren't super young anymore, they're like seven and 15, so he gets to drop the kids at school, go back home, you know, kind of work in the garden, make art and do all of that stuff. And I'm at La Trobe. My studio is also at La Trobe. And I love having my studio on the third floor of our visual arts building amongst all of the people that I, you know, work with every day with all of the students. Um, I try to keep my door open unless I'm really under the pump and have to finish work, then I'll lock myself away. But um, the way that I make it work is that I have realised that separating it all out doesn't work. So for me, um, yeah, my kids come into my studio. My, the last couple of shows, um, my youngest child has been making work with me and um, my day job is where my studio is as well. So it's all collapsed in on each other. Uh, part of my role as well involves research and my research is my practice. So uh, a third of my workload is, is bundled up in being productive as a researcher and that is me making my work. So I get paid to make art. Ideally, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I just make it happen. That's how it, that's how it works for me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so yes, I am a mother. I have three kids, uh, 12, 12, 11 and nine, <laughs> 11 and nine, just turned 11 and nine last week. Mm. And I had a show on and that was just a week. That was a very big week. So <laughs> it just, swells and shrinks and you just make it work, exactly. Um, I think if you're really determined and you want it enough and you want to make art and you have a need to make art, you just sort of make it happen. Um, but also, aside from that, you have to make that happen. So, like I said before, I have dedicated days of studio practice, which is, you know, honestly, Tuesday, Wednesday and half a day on Thursday and sometimes the morning on Friday. The other days, I, I, on Mondays, I'm just mumming all day. I'm just getting anything and everything I need to get done for that. Rob, my husband, is extremely supportive and works from home, which I think helps as well. So we just sort of job share children, really. Um, and they're good kids, so that helps as well. Um, and I guess, you know, conceptually sort of keeping, keeping the ideas going is just a constant Thing. I've come to realise that uh, going and seeing exhibitions is a big part of my practice, so I, I make sure that I go and actually see other people's work and, you know, 
engage with the community as such and talk to gallerists and talk to, to talk to people because I think that's a, a great way of actually you know learning um, and I guess anytime I'm reading I'm reading something to do with art something to do with my practice not not all the time but most of the time when I have the time to read it's so few and you know far between so I, I try and dedicate it to what I'm actually sort of doing um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a bit off topic, but I mean, I subscribe to like the Art Almanac and and and, and um, a magazine like one international contemporary magazine because I just think that knowing what's going on globally and locally is a really good thing. You know, just to flick through when you're having a cup of tea. We're really getting nitty gritty here, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but also what you were saying, Kylie, about um, having your kids involved. Sometimes it's unavoidable. So when there's actually a video here of um, two of three children and Rob and myself installing at the Art Gallery of Ballarat because it was the school holidays and I thought there's no way that I'm going to bring my son here. I mean, he's wonderful, but just no. And um, so my eldest unwrapped, that's, that particular work is 400 small ceramic knots and they're all placed in a grid formation on the wall. So my eldest unwrapped them all put them on the table. My youngest would just sort of, you know, watch and make sure everything was okay. And um, and Rob also, you know, caught, carted all the boxes and did everything. And so I was just free to actually install the work, you know, with a free head, uh, a clear head rather. Um, but, you know, hands on deck, all hands on deck. It, it has to happen. Um, yeah. Is that... Yes, I know. I'm so glad I have that, actually. It's really good. <laughs> and that was my daughter's birthday present that we were using to document it. So, you know, it was like, it's all, it's all just everyone's getting on. Just let that happen. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, what I'm hearing here, too, is it's kind of like this resourcefulness, um, you know, of <laughs> making use of the labour at hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also... Um, this, that sort of collapsing of art and life and interests. So rather than yeah. your art practice sitting aside from your other interests um, and your family and your work, it's where possible to sort of collapse those things. Not always possible, but yeah, yeah where possible, that can be quite fruitful. Um, yeah, so I was also thinking um, about, uh, like we've, we will touch a little bit more on... Um, the uh, the ways artists can sort of self-start and find opportunity and perhaps both of you um, have done that from time to time and earlier in your careers um, so I'd be interested in hearing just you know briefly on that but also the other kinds of opportunities aside from commercial representation things like residencies talks um, you know how they can help fund, especially early in practice, um, so not just sales, but what are the other kind of potential forms of income that can be fed back into your studio practice? Start with you. Sure. <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, re recognising that making art is one element of your practice, but also all these other things, getting involved in the industry is, um, is a, a viable way of sustaining your practice. Um, Recently, I wrote for the Australian Ceramics Journal. I did an exhibition review and wrote for that. And it's, you know, all those little things kind of just go to increase and add up and help you keep making the things that you want to make. Um, and exactly talks and um, us, you know, reviewing certain grant applications or, you know, there's, there's things like that that can sustain your practice other than the selling of work. I mean, obviously, it's nice to sell your work as well. Um, yeah, I think that's mm. maybe your turn. <laughs> um, I guess I've focused uh, a lot of my energy over a, uh, quite a long period of time around being an, an educator as well. Mm. And so... Um, in some ways, having that income um, there to underpin my practice takes all the pressure. I mean, I do sell quite a lot of work. I've got working, you know, big collections and stuff, but I don't depend on that 
to sustain my livelihood. And so, um, apart from the fact that I love working as an educator, it's funny saying it to so many people that I work with in that context, I love what I do with you guys, but it also subsidises and takes the pressure off my practice. So, um, I mean, I'm a painter, so it's not like I'm making, you know, super radically experimental um, work that isn't, com uh, you know, easily, uh, you know, a commodity, but, um, but I don't have that pressure to sell, um, which is really great. And I don't, um, I, I do apply for funding, sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't, um, but I'm not, I'm not dependent, I'm not, I'm not relying on that to also fund really big ambitious projects a lot of the time too, because I have a steady income. So whilst there's, I guess, a side, for me there's a reality around having to really carefully time manage because I can very easily not get into the studio if I'm not careful. Um, I, I, um, I don't forget what, forgot what my trail of thought was. What was I going to say there about time management? Yeah, there, there's not that, I guess, that pressure to, 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 to chase grants and sales. Um, but as far as early kind of... Um, yeah, and when I, yeah, so I worked, you know, I worked in one of my better sort of day jobs when I was a student was I worked in an art store, which was, you know, amazing because I got super cheap art materials for a very long time. Um, but, but, but when I was, yeah, when I was starting out, um, I, I've spent half of my life at art school, I would say. <laughs> easily. So I, I studied, I, I grew up in, in Wollongong, so regional, you know, New South Wales, not far from Sydney, very similar to Bendigo, not far from Melbourne, very similar kind of place, except there's no ocean here, sadly, very sadly. Um, but I, so I, I studied, um, I went to TAFE, then I went to university, then I had five years off and just went and was a person in the world that wasn't studying. And then I came back to university, studied in Sydney at um, UNSW and just kept studying. So did my honours, my masters and then my PhD. And when I started studying my PhD, that's when I started working, I guess, um, within the university system as a teacher, as a, as a lecturer. Or tutor, actually, then. Um, but but when but when I was doing that sort of you know um, trying to figure out how to be um, how to how to get shows, how to build my practice, the first place I went was to artist-run galleries. Um, that's where the community is. That was the, that's where my peers were, um, and that's a really important. Um, stage in an artist's career, so to develop and contribute to that community, not just benefit off it by having shows, but to become part of that crew. Um, and I uh, just started having shows in different artist-run spaces, usually group shows. Um, there's a lot of sort of, uh, you know, you, you have to make that happen on your own, you have to spend money to do it, sadly, um, in terms of paying, usually paying, you know, um, f to, to help subsidise the rent of the, the artist-run space. Um, and so I guess there's, there's years and years of, of doing that. Um, I also applied for lots of residencies when I was a younger emerging artist and was lucky enough to get a, a residency in Paris and spent three months living in the centre of Paris down the road from, you know, the Pompidou Centre and just did that. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Uh, also travelled a lot at that point. Um, I think travel's really, really important if you can afford to do it. It's a, it's, yeah, it's not in everybody's reach all the time. 
um, or maybe even if it only happens once in your lifetime, um, making that happen is, is really important to building your practice. So not only seeing the work that surrounds you here and in Melbourne, but also trying to get out of this country and, and, and see the, the world and that, the art that's everywhere. Um, but yeah, artists run spaces. That's the start. And in fact, starting a space is the start. And also, when you, if you do study and you're at university where you've, or TAFE or wherever it is and you've got this community that's, you know, you've got the conditions set up for a community to happen there, once you leave, try to start up a studio with a bunch of mates and just make art together. Those, that, those things take that community experience and in a very self-determined way, try to get yourself a space where you all make work together and then if you can start a space, that's, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, if there's any artist run space or studio spaces, maybe I should have asked the... You guys might be able to tell me if there's like com communal studio space in Bendigo. Uh, yeah? Yeah, Bendigo. Bendigo. Yes, I've looked you up before. It's good that you're here. Cool. Uh, well, we're developing a website at the so moment. They so they can look you up on, on Facebook. Though. They can look us up on Facebook, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, but getting, you know, I, I guess creating, setting up your own space is the ideal with, with a group of friends, but I know commercial, commercial lease prices here are really expensive because I looked at that when I moved here. I was like, oh, move to the country, I'm going to go get a big, you know, I'm going to go get a big warehouse and I'm going to rent it. And yeah, no, no, it's, it's Melbourne prices, definitely. <laughs> so partly to answer your question, Molly, <laughs> right next to you. I wonder if a Valentine's would fit that because it's run by Sarah Wallace. Yeah, Smith it's quite. And, yeah, yes, it's one. And so of my a, friend Dan, who deals with like sculpture and birds, I mean, and Prince, he's just joined there recently. Frankie O has an upstairs space there too. It's quite expensive, I last will say. Yeah. It's quite an expensive space to rent. That I don't know. Yeah, I do because I, I I looked at it when they first opened. I was talking to Sarah, so I. I don't know that it's kind of emerging artists. Uh, uh, yeah, and... Um, absolutely. Definitely. Yep. yep, definitely. But the thing is, that's... That, that, that's, that's something that we have to do for ourselves. Yeah. Like, don't depend on some organisation to set up a space for you, because, yeah. Just yeah. get together in a huge group and rent a really clapped out old warehouse or shop or something and do your own thing. Yeah, it's definitely possible because um, I basically did just that. I saw mm. the shop front and I basically emailed the dude that owns it and said, what if I just use it for four weeks and I'll give you cash and I'll... I used to work for a not-for-profit who does this for disused or underused buildings, but basically you can get it off the internet where um, you basically do a license agreement, um, talk to them, how are you going to do insurance, tell them how long you want it, and most of the time if it's sitting empty for two years, they'll be like, I have nothing to lose. So I did that in Footscray and I'm sure you could do that here. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, I could fall off. <laughs> um, I think like there's a number of interesting things that are coming up here, and I just want to capture them before we um, like yeah lose some of this. So yeah, there are a number of existing um, studio spaces. So St Andrews Studios, um, the Sarah Wallace Smith, the Bendigo Pottery. Um, you know, there, there are some existing kind of, of groups who have um, sort of 
either bound together and done just that and finding like-minded, you know, your community, like who are other practising artists who are working in a way that resonates with your practice because then together you can really kind of bounce off each other. So it's more than just space. It's about sort of that sustaining your practice through community as well um, and, you know, binding those sort of resources together. Um, and, yeah, the other thing I was sort of hearing there is that there's lots of knowledge in the room. Um, and I want to make sure we, like, hear... We've got a bit of time to actually hear some of that so that you can all learn not just from us up the front but, um, you know, what you're also doing. Um, and then uh, we, we're going to have a session. We're looking next at um, some of these sort of um, models of different spaces, artist-run spaces and... Um, not just gallery space, or, but like thinking about studios and production spaces as well. Um, and also funding some of those things. Um, and I heard the word insurance around leasing and that kind of thing. We've got funding bodies coming in for the last session. So if you've got kind of questions around, um, you know, how as a, you know, an artist without really an income, um, how am I going to insure for public liability? How am I going to, you know, or some of those sorts of questions. Um, we have Narva here who have amazing resources on those things. So I just wanted to like capture that before I forget because I will. Um, and then sort of go back to you and hearing about um, also some of your experiences and how you're sustaining your practices because, um, I mean, you know, I, a bit like you, Kylie, have, um, you know, gone through university and actually doing a PhD was a way for me to very indulgently like be funded um, mm -hmm. to make art um, and to research and you know to have a period of time and a studio so you know for me study was one way to sustain practice mm -hmm. but then going into working in the industry um, so and that feels like quite a kind of privileged position to be able to work in the arts and be around art but I'm aware that there's lots of artists working um, several jobs sometimes um, and outside of the industry and just wondering you know how that functions for you and whether um, you know you're able to sometimes collapse those worlds as well and maybe that you know means that you make um, far more interesting things you know because you're outside of the art bubble maybe you're you know a bricklayer and your art practice is sort of drawing on some of that stuff as well but just before I throw over to you um, Yep, we've got time for this. Um, I just wanted to get a bit of a show of hands. Who's got a studio? Yeah. Um, whose studio is at home? Yeah. Whose studio is sufficient? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who, who's looking for a studio? <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. Who who lives off their art and doesn't do anything else? Yeah. <laughs> okay, who works in the arts? Yeah. And also makes art? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, who's working in a kind of parallel industry or an industry that they think sort of supports their interests in their art? Yeah, there's a few of those as well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and who is like just thinking, I don't have any time for my art practice, no money for it, and why do I have to work two jobs <laughs> to make art? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So who, does anyone want to share how they do what they do and what it's like being an artist here in Bendigo? Nobody? <laughs> We've got a few, yep. On the internet, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so going to the internet to yeah, to seeing what's out there. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rose. I don't have any uh, secret um, solutions apart from I, I'm still working on the commercial side. I do sell sometimes. Um, but the way that I have managed to keep my artistic practice going no matter what is to just get super flexible and incorporate it in the everyday 
with whatever restrictions there are. So, for instance, today I don't have any free time apart from this, so I've been making art while I listen. <laughs> and it's not my um, favourite medium, like I'm a painter who works on massive canvases when I'm at home in my studio, but um, I guess I just have been practising trying to make my practice more flexible to fit life so it's not put at the bottom of the list. Mm. And if that means needing to steal moments of sketching uh, strangers on public transport on the busy days and I only get two minutes of doing that versus not doing it at all, that's what I, I do. Mm. Um, yeah. I'd be really interested to hear what other people have to <laughs> say in the room, though, especially artists who are perhaps, if not... Um, you know, sustaining their entire living just from art 100%, um, even, you know, 40%, 50%, how you've managed to get to that point and also not have it burn out your art practice so you mm. still love it. Mm. Yeah, I've got one little example of someone else, not me. I'm just going to steal their story and I'm not going to say who they are because they might not want me to. <laughs> but they are an artist who worked in a call centre for a long period of time. Um, and produced a whole body of work which was perforating um, A4 pieces of paper with the pen tip of the pencil <laughs> routinely while she was taking these calls. And it was actually like really marking time and talking about the labour away from practice, you know, and it, it was quite poignant work, you know. <laughs> um, I think there's something to be said about what is practice as well because I think if you sort of berate yourself and say if I'm in the if I'm not in the studio it's not practice and I think that's completely untrue mm -hmm. you you know you're drawing you're thinking about you see something you sit, I'm looking at that stripe and I'm thinking of something so I think it's always prevalent and if it's just there sort of at the surface it's a nice way to just keep the the light alive almost because mm -hmm. you know the pen everything it's it's kind of all art it's all practice it all informs what you do so just having time in the studio is wonderful and it's productive but there are all these other little moments that you can just go and just let yourself have that moment of saying yes that's practice you know otherwise you'll you know you don't there's never enough time. and then there's never <laughs> enough time and then you sort of think oh i'm not going to go in the studio because i can't i can't because it's too much of a a battle but actually you're practicing all the time and mm -hmm. i think if you let yourself you know in, not even indulge just if you let yourself allow yourself that then you know that you're always practicing and it's always feeding your your art mm -hmm. can yeah. i also make a point to to follow on from that i absolutely agree like i um believe that going into the studio not everyone has a studio and I've certainly had very um, long periods of my life where I haven't had a studio but I've never stopped believing or um, knowing that you know I'm an artist and this is the work that I do like artists are workers and it's a job and it's you know it's your life um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that um, if you're not physically making art it doesn't mean that you're not an artist at that moment, which, you know, goes back to what you're saying, but also that we all have very different life circumstances and many people in this room um, or many artists don't have um, come from a situation where um, it's easy for them to, you know, pursue this idea of living off your practice. Um, it's that, that, that's a very um, privileged position to find yourself in and anyone who finds themselves in that position, that's, you know, great for them, but it's, it's very rare. Um, and it, it, it also needs to be acknowledged that often um, there's there's something underneath that, that that sets a person up for being able to live that life. Sometimes people are born into situations where they don't have to get a day job to support their practice, they just get to be artists. And, you know, so we need to acknowledge that that's really complex and um, we all have very different situations and histories and experiences. Yeah. 
Um, I want to lead on from that too because I come from a non-art working class background and it's taken me a long time to get to the point of actually being able to work and have an arts practice. So yeah, we share a similar history there. Um, but I did have a question. Uh, are you both represented by galleries? Um, and I just wanted to get a bit more of an understanding about what that entails, the, the idea of being represented by a gallery, I guess, and how that supports or doesn't support your practice. Uh, I am not represented by a gallery. Um, that is in somewhat intentional at this point. I've, I guess my journey to art is quite different. I didn't sort of come through a traditional art school um, lineage. Um, I've, I guess I've worked in, I've come through fashion, I've come through sort of an interest in ceramics, I've come through different, sort of very different avenues. It's, it's, so it's, um, even the way I approach my practice is quite different, like I have a spreadsheet and, you know, like all these sort of things. So, you know, it's very pragmatic on one, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's also very artistic. Um, so, <laughs> and, yeah, artistic spreadsheet. It's a beautiful, so many colours. Um, but I think that, you know, coming from that side, I've kind of come with the knowledge of sort of marketing, sort of the commercial side of things, different skills to art making. And I think I've sort of needed to know with my own practice when I'm ready to actually approach galleries or when, when a, a gallery thinks that I'm ready, that's, you know, we were talking about a two-way street before. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that you sort of know and understand where your practice is at in the context of the rest of the uh, world. Um, so I intentionally haven't sought a gallery because I'm sort of sort seeking all these opportunities myself at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm sort of approaching different people, meeting different people, having some amazing opportunities, doing it by myself. So I don't feel at this point in time that it's, you know, 100% necessary for me. I think in the future most definitely, but, yeah, I think it's also, it's it's empowering to sort of say, you know, do I need a gallery at this point? Do I not? What what do they do for me? Yeah, that's where I'll leave that. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I have a commercial gallery and have previously had two um, represent me. Um, I guess what it does for me in a very pragmatic way now with where I'm at now is that providing it's a productive relationship and it's, you know, it's a good one. Um, which I'm happy that my, I mean, I wouldn't be with the gallery I'm with if it wasn't. Um, it, it, it enables me to, I guess, keep making and know that once every 18 months at the moment, I'll, I'll have a commercial exhibition. Certainly not the only type of exhibition that I have, um, that it's one of the things that I regularly work towards. Um, and so um, doesn't, uh, I don't pay my gallerist money. Um, there's no fee to, to show in the space. Uh, but yeah, he takes 40% commission and he works his butt off to try to get my work and build my, and develop my profile and my career. Um, and so it's totally worth that transaction. And it is transactional. The relationship is transactional. Um, I, the gallery that I used to show at in Sydney, I was with for, I don't know, over 10 years. And that gallery started out as one of Sydney's most established artist-run spaces. And then they transitioned into being a commercial gallery and the community hated them for that for a long time. Um, but, but they navigated that trickiness uh, and so I guess I started forming a relationship with the with that gallery um, by having shows in that the artist run space that they managed um, and and there was a committee of artists that ran that space and you paid to show there um, and so then eventually they approached me to be part of their stable, <laughs> um, weird term, of artists uh, that they represented. 
But the thing about that experience was we were friends before because the artist run space was a, you know, it's a different, it's a community. Um, it's not, it's not a business. So um, we were kind of friends and, you know, we'd, we'd party and go to openings together and there's a real community um, feel to, to being part of that gallery that when they transitioned into being a commercial space, I think both their artists and themselves found it hard to then establish a, like professional boundaries, which is something that everyone navigated, but I noticed when I moved to the second gallery in Melbourne that the way that that relationship was set up right from the outset was highly professional, you know, like, yes, it's kind of transactional, but it's also um, we respect each other and we love working together um, and we socialise, but it's never, um, there's never any um, confusion around, you know, whether we're mates and we'll, in the way that there was initially um, with, the, with the, the other gallery. So I think it's a relationship that's really, can be really, professionally meaningful um, but yeah can be tricky if it's not going well don't want to talk about that though <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be professional <laughs> yeah but but a commercial gallery is not going to um, being represented by a commercial gallery doesn't mean you outsource all that labour around self-promotion and having to drive your career if that's what you want to do as, as an artist. Um, because, yeah, you're one of many people that they work with and they can only, only do so much. So I think you have to manage your expectations if you ever find yourself in that position. Thanks, Kylie. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think we've got room for one more. Yeah. Sorry. To show work for a f period of time. Yeah. yeah. So the question there, we might have missed the start of that, but the online um, spaces and online galleries um, and online re representation. Any thoughts? <laughs> um, I haven't sort of delved into that intentionally, I think because my work is sculptural and I think it needs to be seen in real life. Photos are amazing, but I think if anyone's going to commit to a piece, you know, and, and really get the experience of a piece, they need to see it um, in real life. So. I can't say that I have much experience with it. I think for certain mediums and certain art, it's probably fantastic and the reach is exceptional and you can't beat the amount of people you can get in front of. But I think for my particular work, I don't think it's, I don't think it's viable, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess commercial galleries and most artists have websites. So lots of people only, and I only see lots of shows via the, you know, looking at them online now, which is really um, kind of sad. I'd like to see everything that piques my interest online, I'd like to be able to go and stand in the room with that, that work. Um, so I'm the same as a painter. Sure, my work can look really great online, but I really want people to stand in the space. And I know that when I engage with art, I want it to be, you know, a, a, an embodied experience. So, um, yeah, I, I've, 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 I've had lots of work sell over the years that people have bought off my gallery's website without even seeing it in the flesh. And I always find that really weird that you'd throw heaps of money at something that you've never seen. Um, but people do it. Um, but I also know that during COVID when galleries weren't able to open and yes, sales somehow <laughs> went up, people needed to spend money to feel good about what they were, people who had disposable incomes, I guess. Um, I, I found that really depressing actually when, 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 you know, an artist spends time 
making work and it only gets to um, be experienced online as an online exhibition. And um, so during COVID that happened with lots of commercial galleries and in fact all, 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 all sorts of museums and galleries. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't find it um, satisfying from the perspective of um, being the maker or the person, ex the viewer. But yeah, I guess that's not all about um, selling the work or yeah, yeah. So it is lunchtime. I would like to thank you both, Manal and Kylie. Um, that was wonderful. And also thank you for your contributions. We didn't get as many, you know, as much time as I'd like. So I'd like to just keep chatting about that over lunch. Um, so we are just going a couple of doors up to the pub. But before we do that, let's give um, some thank you. <laughs>